continue with the second uh, speaker, Robert Hawkins from the University of Manchester and University, to be discussing with us who is your ideal pasopinib patient. Robert. Okay, thank you for that uh, introduction. So I, I'd say, who, I'm going to try and answer this by saying who is, who is not an ideal candidate for pasopinib after going through the, the data for, to show you that everybody should be considered for pasopinib. So, just some disclosures. So, pisopinib is, is licensed in the, in the first line treatment and in prior cytokine treated patients. But there clearly are alternatives that are going to be discussed by other, by other uh, speakers. I suppose the, there are also post cytokine alternatives, uh, sunitinib and uh, axitinib. I suppose the issue is how do you com compare these? I suppose there are a number of issues with the treatment of, of renal cell carcinoma. It is a question of when do you start treatment. If you, you have a range of drugs and which you're going to, to choose, we've heard the case for um, sunitinib, but I think there's a compelling case for uh, pisoponib in many cases, and I'm going to discuss the evidence uh, for that. But clearly there are patient-related decisions as well that may sway things uh, since the evidence is far from perfect and far from uh, complete. I suppose that the first issue in our philosophy is does the patient need immediate treatment? Is there a potentially curative treatment for that patient? Is there, is there potentially curative surgery uh, for recurrent or, or metastatic disease? Can we use uh, high dose interleukin-2? Mm -hmm. If, if, we, if it, this is a palliative treatment, then what is the evidence of benefit? What are the overall effects on quality of life? And what are the, the choices between the different options? How do we choose uh, between them? I suppose the, the, the data to suggest that you don't necessarily, you can watch and, and wait in patients with, um, in the tyrosine kinase era uh, is shown here. And this is, this is data uh, from the first line study of pisoponib where patients are randomized to receive either pisoponib or placebo, but were monitored very carefully on placebo and crossed over. And although there was uh, a progression-free survival difference, the overall survival uh, was not statistically uh, different um, and was very similar when you look at the, the curves there. I suppose the issue is, are the groups of patients who, who within that who cannot, when you, when you look back, there are some at the early stage where there appears to be a disadvantage when you look in different subgroups, um, when you look in different subgroups and at uh, uh, prognostic markers, this is a biomarker assessment described a couple of years ago. There are patients with, with poor prognostic markers, such as high IL-6, who uh, appear to do uh, badly. Uh, these are patients randomised here uh, between placebo and uh, and um, uh, and uh, pisoponib. And uh, this is a retrospective look in patients who had either high or low uh, IL-6 at baseline, and there's a clear uh, apparent detriment to patients with, uh, who had high IL-6 at the start, uh, whereas there's no difference in the better prognostic groups who have low IL-6. So there may be a, pa a patient group, it may be difficult to define, who have rapidly progressive disease, and I guess we make that choice regularly, who uh, clearly are not a candidate for watching and waiting. At the other end of the scale, there's patients with limited disease, those who, who are potentially curable by surgery or by other systemic therapies, and we, we still select a subgroup for high-dose uh, interleukin-2, partly based on their histology, partly based on their um, clinical criteria, a fairly limited disease, uh, and, and what we would call uh, favorable uh, histology. And the outcome in those patients is, is extremely uh, good, with around 40-odd uh, percent of patients uh, surviving long-term and free of disease. Uh, the key uh, outcomes also are shown here in those patients who do achieve a complete remission. They have very prolonged survival and very rarely uh, relapse from treatment. So those are a, a, a group that we would try uh, to exclude and give different treatments. When we come down to the uh, first-line treatment, uh, although there are many options, there are no very few direct comparisons between the relevant drugs in the first-line uh, treatment. But the key comparators are, uh, are the trials with sunitinib between pisoponib and sunitinib, the COMPAR study and the PISI study, both of which have been reported relatively recently. 
I suppose a, a key uh, important criteria is that these have predominantly targeted patients with clear cell renal cell carcinoma. Uh, they're predominantly targeted relatively good performance status patients uh, and predominantly relatively uh, good or intermediate prognosis. But when you look at the overall uh, outcome in terms of PFS, uh, there's very little uh, difference. It's a so-called non-inferiority study, uh, but the hazard ratio is 1.047. When you look at uh, response, there's a clear uh, higher response, although again, not very uh, clinically uh, different between, between the two, uh, with a 31% uh, response rate to prosopinib, 25% response rate to sunitinib in the uh, COMPARS study. When you look at overall survival, obviously a key endpoint, again, there's no overall statistical difference, but the hazard ratio uh, slightly favors uh, prosopinib. So there's clear benefits either way in terms of, uh, uh, of efficacy, but really no uh, major compelling reason. When you look at um, overall uh, toxicity, this is as shown in a scatter plot here. These toxicities favor uh, sunitinib and these favor uh, pazopinib. So there are clearly many that favor uh, pazopinib, uh, but some such as abnormal liver function tests, which clearly favor um, sunitinib. I suppose the, the other way of testing this is whether you can evaluate it in a patient preference study. So you expose patients to uh, both drugs uh, and then ask them the question, which one did you uh, prefer? And in a, in a, do that in a, in a blinded fashion. And that is, that's to enable patients to assess the overall uh, effects of treatment in terms of toxicity over a period of, of time, rather than a point measurement that you see uh, when you measure toxicity on conventional uh, scales. So this shows the overwhelming result of the, the PICE study that patients prefer uh, Pazopinib in, in the case of 70% versus 22% uh, with uh, a few un undecided patients. So clearly that's an important measure when we're talking about a, a palliative uh, treatment. Um, what we want is to know what patients uh, think. So I suppose the, the question is how do you balance all, all these up? So there is a small non-statistically uh, difference benefit in, uh, for Pazopinib in terms of PFS. It's the reverse in terms of overall survival. But when you look at response rate, it is statistically significant in favor of pazopinib. When you look at liver function toxicity, it's, it favors sunitinib. When you look at uh, hematological toxicity, it favors uh, pazopinib. In terms of hand, foot, and mouth uh, effects, it favors um, pazopinib. And in terms of quality of life and patient preference, it favors pazopinib. So overall, I would say, Although there are pros and cons of both drugs and you need to make an indiv individual choice, for most patients, the balance favors uh, pazopinib. I suppose, given that, how do, how do we choose or, or should we just say uh, pazopinib should be the preferred uh, patient uh, treatment for most first-line patients with uh, metastatic uh, clear cell renal cell carcinoma? All right, and how do we make those individual choices? I suppose that we, we, we originally thought maybe we should give it to a focus on less fit patients, patients who would not uh, appreciate the side effects of uh, sunitinib, such as sore, uh, sore hands and sore feet, those who use their hands and, and uh, feet for work or, or, or pleasure. Um, but I think as we, there are still patients who we would uh, favor uh, sunitinib uh, for, as we just heard, there's an extensive exper clinical experience with non-clear cell uh, patients with uh, sunitinib, although there's some experience with uh, pazopinib, it's relatively uh, limited. I suppose there's a lot of uh, talk about patients who may prefer a treatment break, and there are some patients whose lifestyle fits with that, but I think it's quite difficult until, you, until patients have been exposed to uh, sunitinib and they have experienced the toxicity, uh, they realize they would like a, a, a break, but that's in, in retrospect. I think there is quite, because of the liver toxicity, there is quite intensive monitoring and potentially uh, in, the treatment interruptions and, and many pa some patients do find that difficult to uh, cope with and so uh, that may be a, a reason for uh, choosing uh, sunitinib, although again it may be hard to identify uh, up, up front. I suppose we are wary of patients who have pre-existing 
uh, liver disease, including those with extensive liver metastases with existing liver function abnormalities, who uh, liver uh, toxicity may be difficult to interpret and, and uh, adjust for. Because do we ever use interferon and bevacizumab? I think we'll hear about that more in the future, but there may be some cases where patients may benefit from interferon or where there are difficulties in giving the, the drugs. I suppose one group where we, we've looked at, when, when we looked at our, our patients who we treated uh, with pazopinib, we treated some 130 patients now in, in a retrospective uh, audit. We looked at, at all of the groups of patients and we did tend to select patients who had uh, poor prognosis uh, initially, reasoning that they were likely to tolerate uh, sunitinib uh, poorly uh, and maybe uh, would benefit from a, a, a drug with less uh, toxicity and better tolerated. I think in general we did find it was reasonably uh, well tolerated, but when you uh, look at this is the outcome of our retrospective uh, audit uh, of patients by HENG uh, criteria. It's very similar whether you look by MSKCC or by, um, or by, um, or by performance status that you see the good prognosis uh, group. Uh, overall survival is, is good and not, not really reached yet. Um, in the intermediate survival, it, uh, intermediate prognosis group, it's around uh, 20 months, but in the poor uh, prognosis group, it, it, it is very poor. Uh, at around five, uh, five, six months. Whether that would be better with any treatment, other treatment is, is open to question. They clearly are poor prognosis patients, but I think it has led us to question whether we should use uh, more temsorolimus uh, in these patients than we have uh, to date. So what do we actually do in, in practice when, when we consider our, our, our patients? Uh, if we, we have around 100 uh, patients who start first-line treatment. As I said, there is an issue. There's a fair number of patients who don't start treatment initially. They're monitored. I think we, we feel that they benefit from a long, uh, potentially long period of time uh, without any treatment at all. Uh, those who do start uh, treatment, we select a group of patients, and of, of, of our patients, around 7% get uh, high-dose IL-2. A relatively low proportion get uh, temsorolimus, but that may increase as we've, we've looked at the poor performance status patients in both um, um, pazopinib and sunitinib treated patients and we get very similar but not encouraging uh, outcomes. Most of our patients do get uh, pazopinib on the basis that it is a better tolerated uh, treatment. Patients seem to uh, prefer it and in terms of efficacy it seems very uh, similar to uh, the alternatives. Obviously, the data is mostly in good intermediate prognosis patients, almost entirely in clear cell uh, patients. And for reasons that I've outlined, we try to uh, avoid patients with, who may run into significant liver uh, toxicity that's hard to uh, interpret. Some, some patients will still get uh, sunitinib in spite of the evidence that uh, it, it may be less favorable in terms of uh, toxicity, uh, particularly with the non-clear cell patients of whom there seems to be increasing numbers as pathologists look uh, more closely at the, the pathology um, and a variety of other uh, reasons including uh, patient preference and some of the uh, issues that I, that I talked about in terms of uh, patients uh, lifestyle wanting wanting breaks not wanting to come for such frequent monitoring uh, etc so thank you for that but the uh, so to summarize the ideal patient would be patient with clear cell carcinoma, performance status, good performance status, reasonable into, uh, prognosis, those who are not suitable for potentially uh, curable treatment and no contraindications and willing to comply with liver function test monitoring, but, uh, but that comprises the majority of patients. So thank you.